And good evening to you. How are you? Wednesday, July 4th, 2018. Happy Independence Day to our listeners in the United States of America. Have a wonderful holiday today. I hope you're in good form if you're listening to this. And if you're not having a barbie, having a few drinks, watching sport, whatever it is you're doing today. Baseball, of course. Big deal today on the 4th of July. Happy Independence Day. This is the Richie Allen Show. We're broadcasting right now on Fab Radio 2, TuneIn Radio, TriggerWarning.tv and RichieAllen.co.uk. Love being with you. Next week, we're back to normal. Live to our shows next week from this coming Monday. Don't panic. It was always a temporary measure, uh, this. Back to normal next Monday. But I've got a lot to tell you over the course of the next hour. Some interesting stories are brewing today. Asking the questions mainstream journalists will never ask. This is your Richie Allen Show on RichieAllen.co.uk, Fab Radio 2 in Manchester, and TriggerWarning.tv. It's the Richie Allen Show. Broadcasting live on RichieAllen.co.uk and multiple platforms around the world. And now, here's your host, Richie Allen. Yeah, happy Independence Day. Whether you're in the UK, whether you're in the US, wherever you happen to be, I hope you're having a lovely one. This is your Richie Allen Show. Over the course of the next hour, we're going to dive into some very interesting stories. Hugely interesting stories. As I said, I just want to repeat, back to normal next week, live to our interactive shows as usual. The Heat has been extreme and it has been helpful pre-recording in the day. Now, it's just after 3.30 in the UK as I record this. Keep that in mind because as I begin to record this, there are stories coming out of Russia, out of Sochi, that somebody has run down pedestrians or one pedestrian in a car and the news bureaus are saying maybe one person is dead, they don't know, and they can't be sure whether it was an accident, an accident or whether somebody did it deliberately. So you might listen to this show later on as it goes out on the 7 o'clock schedule. You might think, Rich, you missed all of that. It's developing, I suppose, and as I speak with you now, there isn't anything that I can tell you other than they're reporting that somebody mowed somebody down in Sochi. Let's hope that it's an accident and let's hope that the media, which is reporting now, and they often jump the shark, don't they? They jump the gun. Let's hope that they've just gotten it all wrong. By the time you hear this, though, there could be another story entirely. Can't say anything about that now. Anyway, this is the scourge of the pre-record. <laughs> Pretty much. You take a risk when you pre-record a news show. But anyway, the stories I'm going to be talking about are ever-present. They're omnipresent. So they're not necessarily specifically um, hard news today, but they're big stories. Here's a hard news story. Well, it's all kicking off in Wiltshire. Dear listener, two people collapsed. Possible, possibly even they ingested unknown substances. They're in hospital. They're in hospital in Salisbury. Counter-terrorism police are there. COBRA, the government's counter-terrorism group, are meeting. But it's not about the Skripals. What is it about? What kind of fuckery is this? Bum, bum, bum. Well, we'll find out from Sky News. Good afternoon. Counter-terrorism police are investigating a major incident in Wiltshire which has left two people critically ill after they were exposed to an unknown substance. In the last hour, a spokesman for the Prime Minister says Theresa May and ministers are being briefed following a meeting of the Emergency Response Committee COBRA this morning. Samples of the substance are now being tested at Porton Down, the UK's military testing facility. Well, it happened in Amesbury, a town less than 10 miles away from Salisbury in Wiltshire. Emergency services were called to Muggleton Road on Saturday, where a couple who are both in their 40s were found. They were taken to Salisbury District Hospital, which is the same place that Sergei and Yulia Skripal were treated. It's now understood that samples have been sent to the military research site at Porton Down. Well, 
Samples have been sent, sent even to the military laboratory, the chemical weapons dump port in town. The pair are in their 40s, were found unconscious in a house on Saturday. It was suspected that it was a drugs-related incident, but now this one is growing a life of its own. Again, there might be developments on this by the time you hear this. The tests are being carried out at that weapons facility. Amesbury is about eight miles away from the Salisbury Russian spy poisoning site. It's still not being determined that the script balls were poisoned or that the Russians did it at all. No evidence, but the media keeps referring to it as the Russian spy poisoning site. Your Sergei Skripal and his daughter Yulia, who've disappeared off the face of the earth now. So there you are. Sky reporter Becky Williams has been reporting from there all day, as she did when the Skripals were allegedly poisoned. And Becky Williams has some interesting things to say about what's going on. What's going on? Uh, when you look at the fact they're sending these samples from these two people to Porton Down, that again is exactly the same as what happened in the Screeple case back in March. And we had to wait some time for the results of that. And then the, the government and the investigators uh, took even longer to release the findings that it was actually the Novichok nerve agent uh, to the rest of the media. So it seems like a similar pattern. And also, all the while, as Adele was saying, you've got these sites across Amesbury and in Salisbury that have now been cordoned off, where this couple went uh, before they became ill on Saturday night. So you've got the church, you've got the park, uh, and various other sites. I think a Boots has now been shut. They released a statement about an hour ago saying that boots. the police have asked them to close in Amesbury. Oh, that must be terrible. Boots is closed. Boots is closed. All these sites are shutting down in Amesbury. What would you do without Boots, eh? Serious stuff, this. Uh, so you can only presume that this couple went there as well. So there are a lot of similarities, especially now as the terror police have become involved, although Wiltshire police are still leading on this investigation. Uh, and, you know, back in uh, March, when Sergei Skripal and his daughter, Yulia, were poisoned, it, it left a lot of people here in Salisbury concerned. You know, Salisbury is a, a beautiful city, very well known for Stonehenge, for its cathedral. Uh, but now in recent weeks, all across the world, it's now known for this incredible Hollywood plot line. And then today, to have this other latest development of another major incident in this city, you know, Amesbury is only nine miles away from here, and they're being being treated at exactly the same hospital, many people will be feeling rather anxious and they will certainly be wanting more information. Becky Williams, Hollywood plotline, she said. Uh, but now in recent weeks, all across the world, it's now known for this incredible Hollywood plotline. Yeah, out of the mouths of babes, eh? It's a scripted drama, dear listener. They're stretching the limits of our credulity. What can we get these people to believe? If these two people, God love them, are genuinely ill in hospital, obviously good luck to I don't know them, so I'm not going to weep for them, but good luck to them in their recovery. But they probably, as was originally suggested, they've probably taken some spice. They're probably like a George Romero extras, probably, like you see them. God love them. I'm not laughing at them, by the way in Manchester and elsewhere, this rotten, stinking, filthy spice shit that's leaving people, like I said, like extras from Dawn of the Dead. That could be it. Somebody seized upon it. Let's see what we can make people believe. Hollywood plotline, she said. Think she's giving the game away there. Well, they're fucking around with our minds is what they're doing, in my opinion. Of course it's Hollywood. Well, at least in the way it's being presented anyway and reported. 24-hour rolling news has become the daytime soap opera in your house, never off, as I have written about extensively and talked about over the last couple of years or more. Now, the residents of Amesbury are well cheesed off because they are being kept in the dark. They're not being told very much at all. Here's one of them. There's been police presence here for the last two days um, since, well, since it's happened. Uh, you, there's been a noticeable presence. There's been a car park up in the car park constantly. Um, but, yeah, if, the thing that's worrying is that, that because they've declared a major incident, that none of us have 
been given any information or you would have thought they'd have done door to door just to let us know what's happened and there's been no information whatsoever. Do you know why? Because the story is a pile of horse shit uh, that if you stacked it all on top of one another, it would it would reach the Van Allen belt, if not the moon. Horse manure. Because if they had been all over the place, these people, since... You know, this, this happened on Saturday and we're only finding out about it now. And if they had been to Boots and to the market and to the fishmongers and over to Tesco, the people in that town would be kept in the loop and every precaution would be taken to ensure their safety. The story is bull spit, in my opinion. And it's only an opinion, I can't say for sure that it's bullshit. But we know the Skripal story is bullshit. Where are the Skripals? Yuli, you did that lovely little video. Thank you for all your support. Thank you. At this time, I don't want to speak to the Russian government. Thank you, but we're okay. Disappears off the face of the earth. Where's her father? Russian ambassador Yakovenko to the UK. He's right. It's a hoax to demonise, to marginalise and to embarrass the Russian government. That's what's really going on. And I'm sure the Russians are watching this situation in Amesbury very closely. Like I said, by the time you're hearing this, if you do pick it up at 7pm UK time on the regular slot, things might have moved on and there might be more news. I don't know. Tell you what, dear listener, we often talk on this program about the century of the self, to borrow the title of the Adam Curtis documentary film, Censorship Reigns, in the Century of the Self. Now, there is a programme on ITV, a TV show. If you want to call it that, it's apparently it's more like soft pornography. It's called Love Island, and it's a big tits and arts festival. Arts, even, tits and arts. Tits and arts, it is. Tits and arts festival, where they encourage people to partner up, and then they film them while they have sex on telly. It is the lowest common denominator. And no, I've never watched it. And don't say, Richie, the lady doth protest too much. I'm sure you do. No, I don't. Couldn't watch that shit. But it's on. And when you're reading the newspapers, you can't help but read it. It's not that you can't help but read about it. But the papers are full of stories about it. This is the lunatic asylum we inhabit today. What's going on? Well, one of the contestants, if you want to call her that, has been hammered on social media and on television and in the tabloid media today because she apparently at some stage or another has supported or shared uh, stuff or posts by the right-wing activist, if you want to call him that, Tommy Robinson. This girl is called Ellie Jones. I'm sure her mother is very proud that she's on Love Island. I doubt she is. She's a customer service and office administrators. uh, Office administrator is what she is. And her Facebook page showed two shared posts adding her support for Robinson and his ideas. And because of that, there has been an absolute avalanche of tweets to ITV to have her kicked off the TV show, which is garbage. But, leaving aside that it's garbage, people demanding that she be kicked out of the villa, kicked off the TV show for which I presume she's being paid because she has an opinion that they don't agree with. This is where we're going. I've said it a thousand times, I'll say it a million. Disagree with people and with their opinions as loudly as you want but don't ever allow for them to be deleted to be silenced to be banned to be censored no matter what they say because no good comes of it demanding she be kicked out because she supports somebody who makes youtube videos and gives speeches her opinions and thoughts warrant her being kicked out of a job effectively as bad as the job might be this is where we're going i knew i'd find some way to get love island into the program and there you are the opportunity was presented to me dear listener 
It is uh, Wednesday show, July 4th, 2018. Very quick bit of Brexit news. Now, a little bit more later on, but not a lot. Don't panic. The official Brexit campaign will be found guilty of four charges of breaking electoral law. The draft of an investigation into Vote Leave concludes that Vote Leave broke spending limits and failed to comply with some of the rules. There will be fines imposed, fines as a result of this report's findings. But the group's former chief executive, the former chief executive of Vote Leave, claimed the Electoral Commission hadn't followed due process. Matthew Elliott has submitted a 500-page dossier to the Electoral Commission rebutting the claims. Vote Leave and Matthew Elliott are saying we've done nothing wrong and we can prove it. However, the Commission said Vote Leave had taken the unusual step of going public having seen the draft report. So the Commission is not happy that having found Vote Leave guilty of impropriety and spending abnormalities or basically illegal spending, they're not happy that Vote Leave have come out screaming, saying, well, no, we didn't do it. So there you are. The Commission finds that Vote Leave made an inaccurate return of campaign expenditure, is missing invoices and receipts, didn't comply with a statutory notice, exceeded its spending limit, and so on, so on, so on, blah, 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 blah. Did Vote Leave, um, is it guilty of any of this? I've no idea. I, of course, am a proponent of leaving the European Union. It's easy for me to say that this is the establishment attacking the result of the referendum by a thousand cuts, death by a thousand cuts. And it might be, but I might be wrong. They might have breached the spending laws and they might have failed to declare this and failed to declare that. But are we to believe that the Remain campaign is whiter than white, really? Three, you know, well, we're, not, we're not three, two years, not three, I nearly said three years, two years after we voted to leave. This nonsense is still going on. A little bit more on Brexit, a little bit later on in this hour. Right, I'm going to take a very quick break. When I return, going to talk about Facebook and how it is, how it operates and how its programs are deliberately designed to get children addicted and how these addictive programs and technology are actually harming children. News on this today. It's a theme that's running through this program, of course. You don't want to miss that. Stay with me back in a minute. Introducing the H2O app, a powerful water structure and application that programs vibrational energies into water through the use of different sound frequencies. Once programmed, the use of water for drinking, cooking, bathing. Give it to your friends and colleagues or spread it around the garden. The list goes on. It's not just water that the app can be used for either. It's great for programming crystals too. The H2O app is free to download and is available on both Android and Apple platforms. For further information, go to h2oapp.online. Have you lost access to important data from a computer hard drive, mobile phone, or other storage device? Maybe you have a broken hard drive containing years of information, or a smartphone that no longer works from which you'd like the pictures, movies, and chats recovered. If you would like to recover data from any type of digital device, including desktop and laptop computers, external hard drives, cameras, smartphones, NAS, and RAID servers, then contact Data Clinic today at dataclinic.co.uk now. There's a place high in the mountains of Spain, a sanctuary where souls gather from all around the globe to learn about themselves and experience powerful changes in the way we see our world. They become awakened to their gifts and their power to heal others. Become part of this ever-growing worldwide family of unique, pure energy healing practitioners. Discover how amazing you truly are. Go to www www.markbayerski.com It could just change your life forever. Forever. The Richie Allen Show relies on your support. Go to richieallen.co.uk and set up a monthly donation today. 
Yes, there is news on that incident in Sochi and it is an accident and it seems to have been abandoned now as a story by Sky News who are acting like children in a sweet shop when not just Sky but everybody else when they heard that a pedestrian had hit somebody in Sochi. Marvellous, brilliant, uh, we, a terrorist incident but no it isn't. Apparently a 63 year old resident has been killed tragically and three people injured after a passenger mounted, excuse me, after a car mounted uh, a pavement and hit pedestrians in Sochi. It looks like the driver fell asleep at the wheel and obviously lost control and mounted the pavement. What a silly thing to happen. What a preventable thing to happen that is. So it ain't terrorism. And Harriet Agerholm is in Russia for the Independent newspaper, which is online now, and that's her contention that it is an accident, a tragic preventable accident, not terrorism or deliberate at all. Um, a lot of disappointed people in the mainstream media. They love that shit. They get off on it. Couldn't care less about the people who die, of course. It's the chance to exploit it and ride it like a wave for several days. They love it. I've written so much about it on richieallen.co.uk. Wednesday's show... Independence Day, so it is, July 4th, big day for baseball, I'm guessing, I'm sure it is, big day for baseball, barbecues as well, have your mates over, be nice to experience a bit of that, did visit the United States in late July back in 2002, no it wasn't late July, it was early July, was I in the States at that time, I might have been in the States on July 4th, but just didn't get involved, <laughs> I don't know why, I'll have to check my my uh, my old diaries, yeah, but I was there, I, w I was in Central America and North America for uh, the best part of um, eight weeks and I'm sure I was there for July 4th. Anyway, shall we move on? Important stuff. Helen Lovejoy, won't somebody please think of the children? It's not funny, this is serious. There's going to be a documentary on television later. It will be online then thereafter. Panorama are looking into Facebook. Why? Because former insiders at Facebook are contradicting things said by the so-called founder of Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg. He maintains that Facebook doesn't try to get people addicted. However, senior insiders have admitted designing ad addictive technology. Senior insiders, Facebook people, admitted designing addictive technology to hook users and technology that might cause harm to children. Sandy Parakilas, or Parakilas, Parakilas, I think, former Facebook platform manager, said the firm's goal was to addict people. They know what the negative effects are and they are not being honest, he said. Leah Perlman was a one-time Facebook product manager and Leah invented the iconic like button. She said she now advised vulnerable teenagers to beware of the site after she became addicted herself. In response to growing concern, a senior Facebook executive admitted that it was now investigating whether habit-forming behaviour is bringing harm to losers. Uh, users even. Losers. That could be a Freudian slip, that. If you're a Facebook user, I'm not calling you a loser, even though I left the platform myself a few weeks ago. So senior Facebook people working there today seem to understand that the cat is out of the bag and that they have to answer for this. Now in this BBC Panorama programme tonight, tech insiders express alarm at the way younger children are being targeted with the launch of Facebook Messenger for 6 to 12 year olds, which we've talked about on the programme before. Here's a sneak preview of the Panorama show today. You're going to hear Asa Raskin. He's in Silicon Valley and he invented the scrolling window. You know the scrolling window where the page never ends? You don't have to click onto a new page. Aza Raskin, Silicon Valley. You will hear the presenter first, then Aza Raskin. Aza Raskin has made millions creating some of the slickest features of our browsers, health and music apps. As a top Silicon Valley designer, Aza knows how to make technology manipulate our behavior. There's a, a famous experiment with, um, with soup bowls. If a bowl just silently by itself just keeps refilling itself where you don't see it, 
do people eat more? It turns out, yeah, people eat a lot more um, because you don't have the cue of like, I've, I've finished. Aza invented a phone feature that mimics the soup experiment, the endless scroll. Once you'd scroll and have to click to get to the next page. Now the page never ends, sucking us endlessly in. We found that if you don't give your mind or your brain the time to catch up with your impulses, you don't give people stopping cues, you just, you just keep scrolling. The thing we didn't realize is we were using our design techniques and it became so powerful that it just addicts people. How do you feel about that now that you know oh, man. that it's habit for me? Do you um, feel guilty? Yeah, I do. Yeah, he says he feels guilty. Asa Raskin there, he invented this scrolling, never-ending scrolling page technology. Pretty scary in terms of what's happening to children. And they're not putting too fine a point on it. They're saying it could be devastating for children. Now, it's only a few months ago that we heard from Facebook's first ever president who acknowledged this problem. His name is Sean Parker. So here's a little reminder of what he told Good Morning America on a segment on that program earlier this year. Sean Parker, first ever Facebook president. That thought process was all about how do we consume as much of your time and conscious attention as possible. It's a social validation feedback loop because you're exploiting a vulnerability in, in human psychology. The 38-year-old mogul admits he, along with other pioneers of social media, knew what they were doing. We understood this consciously, and we did it anyway. Facebook estimates it's more than 2 billion users spend about 50 minutes per day on its apps, including Instagram and Messenger. It literally changes your relationship with society, with each other. While the medical community has yet to classify social media as addictive, like alcohol or gambling, one recent study found that participants who appeared to use social media most compulsively showed changes in the part of the brain that controls impulse. Absolutely. Of course it's changing the brain and it's making it diff difficult even for you to relate to other people. It's preparing you for the coming hive mind for the cloud, for transhumanism. People have to wake up to that now. There's no escaping it. The proof is there. It isn't, it isn't conjecture. It's not a hypothesis. It's a fact. This is what they're doing. Deliberately changing your physical body, your physical brain to prepare it for what they want in the future, which is a mind that's hooked up to the cloud so that your body can then be transformed basically into whatever they want to transform it into. This is transhumanism. Read about it. It's no joke. And back to some of these former Facebook insiders. Sandy Parakilas, who's a former Facebook manager. He said, the end goal is to acquire customers at an incredibly young age. Consider considering the addictive nature of Facebook, it's really concerning that they are now targeting even younger children without clear standards for what is okay and what isn't. And back to Leah Perlman, who invented the like button, which led to her becoming addicted. She said, I noticed that I would post something that I used to post and the like count would be way lower than it used to be. Suddenly I thought I'm actually also kind of addicted to the feedback. That's right. It's validation. Addiction to validation, amongst other things. You know, Aza Raskin, who we just heard there a minute ago, saying that behind every screen on your phone, there are literally a thousand engineers to try and make it maximally addicting. It's as if they're taking behavioural cocaine and sprinkling it all over your interface. Deliberately. Deliberately. It's not just an accident. And that's what they want you to believe, that these people, it was with good intentions, they just didn't think it through. They're really good people, Fuckerberg and all the others, Zuckerberg, really good, and they didn't realise that it would have such negative implications. Bollocks! Of course they did. And we know that Fuckerberg or Zuckerberg, or whatever his name is, has repeatedly lied when asked, is it being manipulated to be addictive, right? Remember, he was at a Senate hearing in the United States on Capitol Hill only a few months ago. Here he is, caught out in a 
Don't face life. We're almost at time, so I want to I want to ask you one more. Uh, do social media companies hire consulting firms to help them figure out how to get more dopamine feedback loops so that people don't want to leave the platform? No, Senator. Eh? That's not how we talk about eh? this or, or, or how we uh, set up our product teams. We want our products to be valuable to people, and if they're valuable, then people choose to use them. Are you aware of other social media companies that do hire such consultants? Not sitting here today. Ah, Zuckerberg. You see, Pinocchio, a lie keeps growing and growing until it's as plain as the nose on your face. Until it's as plain as the blue background with the white Facebook writing or letters or font. Liar. Absolute liar. He knows damn well what's going on in his company. But they still persist in the line that... These things were designed to bring people closer to their friends and family. That's what it's all about. We don't want to make it addictive. This lie, this lie, this lie, like the blue fairy says, that grows and grows and grows and grows. Doesn't matter how many people come out and say, well, we used to work for Facebook, and we know because we used to design the shit. Now, Jaron Lanier, or Lanier, let's say Lanier, is a computer scientist, and he was on BBC's Hard Talk show. And he told BBC's Hard Talk Show that people should delete their social media accounts. It's one of the things he said. You will hear the presenter first. I think this is good stuff. The direct experience of users and what they... You won't hear the presenter first. This is Jaron, Jaron Lanier himself. And it's important to listen carefully to what he says. He's a computer scientist. The direct experience of users and what they do can often be quite legitimate, quite positive, quite authentic, and I'd be the last to dispute that. The problem is that in the background, it's feeding this manipulation machine that's also present. What, what I would advocate is not attempting to destroy the whole thing. Instead, what I'd, what I'd advocate is getting rid of this background manipulation machine and keeping the good well, part. Well, to be fair, you know, the book you've written, 10 arguments for deleting your social media accounts right now, I mean that, if everybody reading the book were to take it seriously and act upon it, would be a death knell for companies like Facebook. Well, Facebook has two advantages that make the scenario you're describing extremely unlikely. Uh, one is that they've deliberately created an addictive scheme so that uh, large numbers of people are genuinely addicted and will not be able to delete their accounts. And uh, two, they have a network effect lock where there's nowhere else to go because everybody's already on their scheme. So therefore, um, when I say this, I have really two reasonable hopes. One is that young people who have only known life while they're connected to these things will, it will be motivated to get off them at least for a while I, uh, in order to, for purposes of self-exploration, to get a sense of contrast to what life is like without the manipulation. And then the second thing is, um, if the whole society is universally tied into a manipulative scheme, then it's impossible to have conversations because there's no one left to give perspective. So if even, if, if even only a minority of people are off of them, then it widens our possibilities, it widens our conversation. Well, good stuff. He's, he's very optimistic there. It's devastating for social interaction and for personal development. But it, don't worry about getting everybody off it, even if you get a minimum of people off it, he said. Dear listener, if you have young children, take the phone, the tablet or the laptop away from them. It'll be the best thing you will ever do for them in their lives, short of not vaccinating them. Get them away from it. I mean, do get them away from it. It's terrible in this weather to be out and about. You know, even if it's only just going to the shops to run an errand, which uh, which I do, because I obviously have to do that stuff being based working from home. And to see this weather, this glorious weather, and the lovely parks we have around here, and to see children in those parks not running after a football, not jumping rope, not chasing one another, not playing hide-and-go-seek, no! Looking at these fucking things. Best thing you could ever do for your child. Take it away. However much they scream and kick and cry. Take it away. Quick break. Back in a minute. With an astonishing story about a game designed for children that has a scene in it of a gang rape. Not making this up. A game designed for very young children through a downloadable app which has a gang rape scene in it. 
You think I'm making it up, right? It sounds like Daily Mail stuff. Sensational stuff. Uh, it isn't. I'll tell you about it after these. Have you lost access to important data from a computer hard drive, mobile phone, or other storage device? Maybe you have a broken hard drive containing years of information, or a smartphone that no longer works from which you'd like the pictures, movies, and chats recovered. If you would like to recover data from any type of digital device, including desktop and laptop computers, external hard drives, cameras, smartphones, NAS, and RAID servers, then contact Data Clinic today at dataclinic.co.uk now. There's a place high in the mountains of Spain, a sanctuary where souls gather from all around the globe to learn about themselves and experience powerful changes in the way we see our world. They become awakened to their gifts and their power to heal others. Become part of this ever-growing worldwide family of unique, pure energy healing practitioners. Discover how amazing you truly are. Go to www. www.markbayerski.com It could just change your life forever. Forever. Introducing the H2O app, a powerful water structure and application that programs vibrational energies into water through the use of different sound frequencies. Once programmed, the use of water for drinking, cooking, bathing. Give it to your friends and colleagues or spread it around the garden. The list goes on. It's not just water that the app can be used for either. It's great for programming crystals too. The H2O app is free to download and is available on both Android and Apple platforms. For further information, go to h2oapp.online. Welcome back. <laughs> I was scrolling down there reading something and I lost where I was just for a minute. Yeah, I was just checking. Was there anything more coming out of Sochi there? But there isn't. Nothing more as I record this coming out of Salisbury either. This is your Richie Allen Show. It is Wednesday, July 4th, 2018. And I promise you this is the last. Uh, this week is the only week of the pre-recorded show Back to full two-hour live shows next week, and it will always be like that. The reason I did this this week is because the weather has been extreme. And even though it's cooled a little bit, and I have to be honest about that, today and yesterday cooled a little bit. It doesn't make, that's outside, it doesn't make a difference to the temperatures in the studio, which are horrendous. So um, it's been good to be able to pre-record it this week, and I've not left you down. We've had some very interesting stories, I think, anyway and some interesting content, and we've got more to come. What sort of... I mean... Ha! Ah, Jesus! Listen to this. This is BBC website today, and it was also covered by a number of newspapers today in America, in the United States. A mum in the US has written a Facebook post describing her shock at seeing her child's avatar being gang raped by others in the online game Roblox. Did you hear that? Because I'm going to read it again. A mother in America has written a Facebook post describing her shock at seeing her child's avatar. See where we're going? Avatars. Anyway, seeing her child's avatar being gang raped by others in the online game Roblox. What kind of fuckery are you? Jesus, Amy. The woman's name is Amber Peterson. Said her seven-year-old was playing the game, which is aimed at children, marketed to kids, when she showed her the screen and asked her mum, what was happening? She also shared screenshots which showed two male avatars attacking her daughter's female character. Roblox said it banned the player who carried out the action. However, the mother said she felt traumatised and violated on so many levels. The screenshots included a representation of male genitalia. How does that happen? How do you design a game and market it to children? With male genitalia in it. With characters gang raping others. How does that happen by accident? It can't. Jesus. Roblox, the, the, the manufacturers are saying we're outraged that a bad actor violated our community policies and our rules of conduct. We have zero tolerance for this behaviour, said a spokesperson. 
uh, we work to ensure a safe platform is, and that's a top priority. So Roblox, popular multiplayer game marketed to children, has been compared to Minecraft. You can use your avatar to gang rape another avatar and to display male genitalia to children. Just move on. What else can you say about that? See where this is going? Also in the UK press today, it's like an all-out assault on children. And again, you, you sound a bit like Mary Whitehouse or Helen Lovejoy. Won't somebody please think of the children? It sounds hysterical, it sounds hysteria, it sounds exaggerated, but it isn't. Four in five nurseries have banned toy weapons, saying that they fuel aggro. Aggro means aggravation. We're going to ban toy weapons because they're causing aggro. One in 20 are prohibiting superhero outfits because superhero outfits fuel aggro as well. A woman called Sue Lerner, editor of review website Day Nurseries, which ran the poll, said they fear toy guns and swords encourage aggression, violence and a chaotic atmosphere. They tell us kids in costumes take on the superhero's persona and run around shouting, you're going to die, bang, bang. But she said, if we ban toy weapons, we control imaginative play. Who'd want to stop children using their imaginations, I wonder? Lerner quizzed over 1,100 bosses and staff and a lot are saying, a lot of these nursery people are saying cops and robbers, baddies versus goodies, these are not good games for children. Lerner herself says, with obesity rising, we need to stimulate energetic role-playing amongst children. What's going on? All of these stories are connected. Here's a story that you're going to be absolutely picking your mouth off the floor. This is from Matt Pickles, who's a BBC News global education editor. The headline is, Putting Death on the School Timetable. Matt Pickles. And the subheading is, Maths, Science, History and Death. This could be a school timetable in a state in Australia if a proposal by the Australian Medical Association, Queensland, is accepted. They want young people to be made more familiar with talking about the end of life. They're only starting out in life. Fuck! Leave them alone. This is madness. Doctors are saying in Queensland that improvements in medicine and an ageing population alarm bell means that there are rising numbers of families facing difficult questions about their elderly relatives and how they will face their final days. But too often, young people in the West are not prepared for talking about such difficult decisions. There is a taboo around the subject and most deaths happen out of sight in hospitals. Pupils might have reservations about lessons in death education, but the doctors argue tough. If the law and ethics around palliative care and euthanasia were taught in classrooms, it would make such issues less traumatic and help people make better informed decisions. Yes, let's get into schools with young children and get them talking and thinking about death and euthanasia. Wow. Wow. Who benefits? That's fucking trauma. Don't talk to young children about death until they experience it. When the hamster or the guinea pig or the kitten or the dog or the budgie dies, you have a conversation as a parent with your child about death. If grandmother or granddad dies, please God, they're well into their very old age. You have a conversation with your child about death. Why would the education, why would the medical fraternity want to impress upon schools the need to talk about death and euthanasia to children? To fuck with their minds is the answer. And to pave the way for a world in which old people who have become useless eaters can be given a little little pill in their soup and just drift away. That's what's going on. Where 
is the opposition to this. None! Because the BBC is reporting it out of Queensland. They're reporting a doctor called Richard Kidd who says this is brilliant, great idea, but they haven't found the counter-narrative. They haven't presented the other side. There must be child welfare people, doctors, paediatricians who say this is crazy. It's madness. You know, to counter this shit, we need to have in the government a new ministry. We need to invent a new government department to counter all of this craziness. There should be a department for leaving children the fuck alone. I'll be the secretary for leaving children the fuck alone. Welcome back to Sky News. Joining me now live from Manchester is the secretary for leaving children the fuck alone, Richard Allen. Hello to you, Mr. Allen. Your reaction, Mr. Allen, to the news that superhero outfits are banned and skirts for girls are banned and the children will be asked to learn about euthanasia. Uh, hi, thanks for having me on. Well, I think we should just leave children the fuck alone. Richard Allen, Secretary for Leaving Children the Fuck Alone. Thank you for joining us. Leave children alone. Death and euthanasia. It's a joyous time, childhood. Death has to be confronted, of course it does. When it happens, that's when you confront it. Or when your child says, as I'm sure a lot of young children do, Mom or Dad, when will I die? You have a conversation. And you're honest, but gentle. Careful with your words, but honest. And you say to your child, I don't know what you'd say to your child there. I was thinking hard there. Not being a parent. You don't lie, but you don't hammer them either. Tell them the truth, but be careful with the language you use. Telling them about euthanasia in schools. Christ almighty. Mentioned a bit about Brexit earlier on. And I want to finish with it today. Because this is very serious. The Prime Minister of this country is meeting with her cabinet at the traditional country retreat for Prime Ministers. It's called Checkers on Friday. That's the day after tomorrow. Where they're basically going to agree on the softest possible Brexit in order to beg the European Union to give them a deal. That's what's going to happen. It's a tyranny. Right. But today, the government set out its plans for the future of fishing after Brexit. The government, because fishing is huge, and I've talked about it a lot. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of jobs have been lost on our coasts over the years because of fishing quotas determined by the European Union, where boats from other countries come right up to our shores and fish like it's no fucking tomorrow. And we have only limited access to our own waters. Anyway, the government has published a white paper and it says devolved nations, basically Scotland, Northern Ireland, um, Wales, will have a say in setting annual quotas for third countries. But the Environment Secretary's decision will be final. This intends to move to a system of quota management which it believes will guarantee a fairer share of the fish in UK waters for UK registered boats. The move has been welcomed by the Northern Ireland Fish Producers Association. Right? Now, as it stands, the rules of the European Union's common fisheries policy will continue to be implemented and will be applied until New Year's Eve 2020. That's if there is an agreement, by the way, between the European Union and the UK. But after that, in theory, theory is wonderful, practice is totally different, in theory the UK will become an independent coastal state which will negotiate access to its waters annually. The government says it will give particular attention to enabling cross-border cooperation with the Republic of Ireland in fisheries management, in line with their previous commitments in the European Union. Now, back in March, the EU and the UK agreed the terms of this transition period, this period after Brexit, to run until New Year's Eve 2020, so that we can all get used to the new arrangements. But as you know, there is a lot of people who are very hard at work to extend the transition period for even longer. 
to extend Article 50 even, so that we never leave really. Now on fishing, which is massive, the country's fishing industry was shafted because when they agreed the terms of the transition period back in March, that's Brexit Secretary David Davis and EU negotiator Michel Barnier, they agreed that the European Union, as I just mentioned a minute ago, will continue to dictate fishing quotas with the UK consulted on those quotas, which was an outrage back in March and pissed off everybody, fishermen, fisherwomen and the fishing industry in this country. And at the time, Member of Parliament Douglas Ross said it would be easier to get somebody to drink a pint of cold sick than to sell this as a success. So is he assured then by Michael Gove, the Environment Secretary and this brand new white paper. Here's Douglas Ross, Conservative MP. I shared the disappointment of many fishing communities when we didn't get the deal we were hoping for back in March, but what we now see in the white paper uh, is a very clear signal that we are leaving the hated common fisheries policy, uh, and I think the government and the minister and the team have moved considerably uh, from the position we were in in March of this year, and we've already seen reaction in Scotland from the fishing industry is very positive to the white paper. Does Mr Gove need to spell out the percentage of fishing quotas that British fishing fleets will be able to catch, because that has been one of the key bones of contention at the moment. I think we are only allowed to catch about 40% compared to countries like Iceland, which catch nearly 90% of their fishing stock. Well, I think these figures are very important, but regaining full sovereignty of our fishing waters is the most important thing for the fishing industry, and that's clear in the white paper. And ensuring that we don't trade uh, our fishing stocks for access to EU markets is also important, and that's spelled out very clearly in the white paper. Not trading away fishing rights for access to the single market. That's very important. He's right. May and Davis shouldn't say to the European Union, if you give us access to the single market, we will be, we lean towards your way of doing things on fishing. But the European Union won't have it, of course, because killing sovereignty, sovereignty by taking uh, things like fishery policy away from a nation is very important for the fascists in Brussels. More from MP Douglas Ross. Good question by the presenter here. And how concerned are fishing communities at the possibility that if we do not get a good trade deal, then there could be barriers, delays to exporting fish to Europe. Well, that is a concern and that's been heard loud and clear by the government. I think all these negotiations with the EU sometimes show why so many communities in uh, Murray, parts of Murray, particularly fishing communities, voted to leave the EU was because of the, this type of reaction from the EU. So it works both ways and I think the European Union have to recognise the importance the United Kingdom is placing on fishing and they have to replicate what we are seeing with their own action. But the European Union doesn't want to agree to anything. It wants to let the clock run down. It wants to provoke a no-deal situation, which actually would be good for the UK. But the European Union knows that Parliament and the UK media and every other betrayer of democracy that has its hands in the pie of destroying Brexit, it, it, excuse me, its hands in the works, in the machinations of destroying Brexit, they won't allow the UK leave without a deal. And that's what's going on. And what will come out of Chequers this weekend will be horrifying for everybody who voted to leave the European Union and who voted on the basis that leave means leave. What May's going to come back with is basically she's going to offer the European Union an incredibly soft Brexit that's like associate membership of the European Union. That's what's going to happen. Mark my words. Will they accept it? They might do. I don't think they will, but they might do. They might do. Pretend that the UK is leaving, but it isn't really. You know, free movement continues. The UK, the, the EU even dictating things like fishing quotas and other really important things continues. But we'll let them pretend they left. That is a possibility. But I think it's also a possibility that the European Union will say no to whatever the government comes back with. Because it doesn't want there even to be the appearance of leaving. They're absolutely determined not to negotiate. They've been negotiating in bad faith because we were never going to leave. Something I've said a thousand times on the programme since the 24th of June 2016. That's pretty much it for 
Wednesday's programme. Thanks for your time. I really appreciate it. Do share it when you see it on social media. I know it doesn't work, but do it anyway. Or at least let people know about it face-to-face that they can hear this radio programme. Remember, listen carefully to this. Back to normal next week, even if it is hot. Back to normal next week. This was a good break. I mean, I'm doing the programme every day this week. But but it's a good break from last week's madness, being in the studio in the early evening. It's been a good break and it's helped me out a bit. And I've been able to get a couple of hours sleep after I record this because I've not been sleeping well in the evenings. I'm sure you've had that experience yourself here in the UK where we are unaccustomed to this sort of weather. But we're enjoying it despite the fact that we're not sleeping so well. I'll be back with you tomorrow, Thursday. Remember, 7pm UK time, as usual, even though it's pre-recorded. Back to live two-hour shows with guests next week. Don't worry about that. Going to leave you with some Bob Marley. And um, this isn't a Freudian slip. There's no hidden message here. I just love the song. It's uh, No Woman, No Cry. I do have a woman. And I suppose I'm not crying. Well, at least not now, anyway. Good stuff this. Uh, See you tomorrow at 7 at the usual time. Until then, bye for now. And again, if you're in the US, or if you're here and you happen to be American, or if you're here and you happen to be celebrating Independence Day, a massively uh, happy Independence Day to you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bob Marley. I could have played Living in America by James Brown. I'm well aware of that. But I wanted to hear this. All right. See you tomorrow. Bye. Bye.